So, in the past lecture, we have been discussing all the observations which are essential to understand the characteristics of cosmic rays in our galaxies. That is, which volume they basically fill, how long they remain in the galaxy, energy spectrum, composition, and so on. All of these measurements were based upon the measurement of the local cosmic ray population. That is, we take direct measurements as well as, to some sense, indirect measurements, but we measure the local cosmic ray population. So this is effectively what is observable uh, after this cosmic ray population is propagating within the diffusion zone of the galaxy. However, we do not um, have a way of measuring directly what is happening at the source. And we're coming back to a theme which I discussed at the beginning, that is the so-called multi-messenger astroparticle physics. So we are now going to be using and looking a little bit at what we learn from other messengers, which are basically allowing us to observe directly the sources and the accelerators of cosmic rays. Mind you, we started that discussion already a little bit at the end of last section, where we were looking at an X-ray image from Tycho Supernova Remnant. However, this is essentially a very indirect way of probing the cosmic ray population, because we are looking at secondary effects which do not directly relate to the particle population present in the source. So let's talk about uh, gamma ray and neutrino measurements. And this is the new section B1.7. And I put the neutrino here in parenthesis because, as it turns out, the neutrino measurements are still not sufficiently sensitive to uh, detect sources. So the concept of this uh, approach is already quite some known for some time, but it reminds us in principle to what we're doing in beam dump experiments. As you remember, beam dump experiments are experiments where essentially I take a high energy particle beam and I let it slam into a massive target. And then I basically, for example, can extract the neutrinos because they pass through the matter essentially without any interaction. And here the situation is quite similar. So if you imagine now uh, taking a supernova remnant, so let's make a very simple picture of supernova remnant. First order is just a sphere, which basically is the forward shock of the uh, expanding blast wave. And uh, we learned that in this uh, shock region, we will have uh, particles accelerated. So we can sort of imagine that um, particles will be um, existing or energetic particles will be accelerated in the um, outer part of this uh, shock or in the in the region of the vicinity of the shock. So we can essentially assume there's something like a population of uh, particles which live in the vicinity of this of the shock. I just draw it here like a, a thick orange line now. So that will basically tell us about this volume which is filled with particles accelerated in the shock. And we also learned that this has some back reaction onto the um, actual shock itself if the cosmic ray pressure becomes substantial. So that would be basically here our cosmic, ray uh, cosmic rays or accelerated particles, because they are still not cosmic rays, they are still sitting inside the source. Now, in this uh, region where the particles exist, they basically will interact with the gas. And through that interaction, we get similarly to a beam dump experiment, secondary particles, and um, the ones which can escape freely are the gamma rays and the neutrinos. So we can expect that there will be uh, neutrinos coming out through interactions. I just draw them here as straight lines. And the neutrinos will basically um, be without any further interaction, and we can detect them, or we can search for them, as a matter of fact. Also, the gamma rays will come out. The gamma rays, <coughs> similarly, would basically just escape the region, and they travel without any deflection, and essentially without absorption. There's a little bit of an absorption once the energies are sufficiently high to produce pairs in, for example, the cosmic microwave background field. Then the mean free path of gamma rays gets shortened to a few kiloparsecs, and even in the galaxy they will not propagate freely. But if we talk about galactic length scales of several kiloparsecs, there's no absorption present up to PEV energies. So they can basically travel free. And there will also be cosmic rays leaking out. However, the cosmic rays, they will basically, you know, start doing the diffusion process. 
So they will not be you know, visible directly, so we will detect them, but we'll detect them as cosmic rays being part of a, um, of a relativistic gas which is, is sitting inside the, the uh, galaxy. So that's this basically the multi-messenger approach because we learned all about the cosmic rays that we can measure. We can, however, trace them. We cannot trace them back to the original source. And now let's have a look at the gamma ray and at the um, uh, neutrinos. So it's essentially like a beam dump. And so we will have interactions where a proton of, uh, or heavier nuclei, but I just write here the proton because it's the most abundant, will interact with a proton of the background gas that could be either in the vicinity of the supernova remnant or it actually could be also in the vicinity further out where you have maybe some dense clouds, clouds of gas. But there will be just the background gas which this will interact with. And this will be then in elastic scattering processes, so we will produce either proton neutron in the end uh, but we will very likely produce pions and maybe other um, um, mesons. So I just write down here pi zero and pi plus and pi minus maybe. And these will then decay. So for the pi zero, it will be essentially immediately. They will decay into two gammas. Let me just write gamma gamma here. And the pi plus will decay into um, a mu plus plus a mu neutrino or respectively in a mu minus um, with a new mu bar. And these then, these neutrinos will be detectable um, and the photons will be detectable as gamma rays. Now the, the average energy lost, that is the fractional energy lost in this process, is um, roughly so that the energy of the pi naught will be round about the um, energy, will be proportional to the energy of the incoming proton. And it will basically be roughly given by the ratio of the rest mass of the pi to the rest mass of the proton. So this is about a ninth. So a little bit more than 10% of the energy will be dumped into a secondary pion. And they will decay into two gammas. In rest, they will be emitted back to back. But if you look at the relativistically boosted system or the system in which we are observing it, which is uh, which is the lab system where the uh, pion will have a Lorentz factor of, depending on the energy, but let's say 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. So they will be emitted in the forward direction and the resulting energy spectrum of photons will trace out essentially the same kind of spectral shape as the proton spectrum that was initially there. Now, um, let's take a look at how much gamma rays, what is the luminosity that we can expect? Let me just write it maybe in blue again. So the luminosity of a supernova remnant in gamma rays. We call this L gamma. And L gamma will be given by the total cosmic ray energy density, or no, sorry, net energy density, but the total cosmic ray energy content that is being uh, present in the particles accelerated, divided by the um, mean free time bit, uh, that is lifetime for the protons uh, for this inelastic scattering process. So basically proton proton into pi naught. That's that's an estimate sort of. So we, all we need to know is what's the total cosmic ray energy that is in the supernova remnant and then the, deep, uh, the this lifetime. So for the uh, cosmic ray content we said this would be roughly eta times 10 to the total kinetic energy which is 10 to the 51. Ergs, or 10 to the 44 joules. So that would be of the order of 10 to the 50 Ergs that we are dealing with. Now, the tau uh, process, or the tau, uh, the time that is characteristic for this process, that's given by the um, square, the the inverse of the, uh, the the gas density. That is number density, number per volume times the velocity of the particle, which is about c, times the branching ratio to produce a pi naught, times the cross-section for PP interaction. Okay, And for these numbers, we can all take reasonable guesses. So uh, we can say the N gas is about one per cubic centimeter. Could be a little bit bigger, could be a little bit uh, smaller. Uh, smaller specifically when you were dealing with conversion in the, in, the, in the bubble, which maybe was blown by the progenitor star. 
could be also substantially bigger if you have uh, large uh, sort of clouds of, of gas sitting nearby. The um, um, branching ratio is about 0.4. So that means that about 40% of the cases you produce a pi naught. And the cross-section for a proton-proton direction is, I wrote down a number here, 40 millibar. That is slightly energy dependent, but not very much. So this rises only with the logarithm of the energy of the proton. So this, it's a good estimate, reasonably good estimate to put this in. So that means that for the, for the total, we will get a number which is 6 times 10 to the 7 years, assuming a density of 1 per cubic centimeter. And so this goes with the density in the, in the denominator because larger density means shorter uh, lifetime of proton-proton interaction, proton -proton interaction. So if we put the numbers in and we plug them into our equation, then we get L gamma is equal to 5 times 10 to the 34 ergs per second. And that's about 15 solar luminosities um, if you basically take the bolometric luminosity of our sun and then this is basically the equivalent in the gamma ray luminosity. And that's quite a lot. That's, that's, uh, that should be detectable. So this is um, supernova remnants are expected to be bright. In gamma rays. And this should be observable, right? So this is, this is the main feature. And now um, just giving you an example of, of a uh, successful observation of a supernova remnant with one of the gamma ray instruments that we discussed. Let me just take that over from my other notes. So this is the picture that uh, became quite famous because this was the very first time that it was possible to actually first of all, detect unambiguously gamma rays from a shell-type supernova remnant in gamma rays. So this is a picture which is taken at energies above 250 GeV. And the picture shows us, now Paul's color, the color scale basically gives us an idea of how many excess counts we've got per angular interval. So this is basically like a picture if you want. And uh, it's in a, drawn in a sky map. And uh, the sky map basically gives us the sky coordinates in right ascension and declination. And so these are equatorial coordinates. And um, this, uh, the, the, the y-axis is the declination. And you can reasonably, reasonably easily see that, roughly speaking, the size of this thing, the diameter of this thing, is almost a degree. So it's, it's quite a, a big uh, region in the sky that, uh, however, allows us then also to resolve out the, the shell-like feature. So you can clearly make out that there's, there's a shell you know, this would be then a shell which you would draw around, it's roughly circular, and you would see that there's a region here which is very bright, not so bright over here, and um, also overlaid is some contour lines. Um, actually, the picture looks very similar to the picture that you get when you observe the same sources in X-rays. However, now we see for the first time really that there's a shell forming, that means we are tracing the uh, population of, of energetic particles in this uh, supernova remnant. And they are accelerated, obviously, in the blast wave of this uh, shell, of the supernova. Now, um, this confirms in principle, principle that there is cosmic rays accelerated. And in the picture of proton acceleration, basically, if you assume 250 GeV gamma ray energy, I said roughly 10%. So that means that what we're looking at is 2.5 TeV protons, which are producing 250 GeV gamma ray emission. Now, of course, we can also measure the energy spectrum from the source. And that's an interesting story. So I just bring over again a plot of the what we call spectral energy distribution. So spectral energy distribution means that we are plotting here a quantity, uh, which is the flux that we observe from the source times the energy squared. So the flux is measured in photons per area per time as well as per inter interval of energy and if we multiply that with e squared we weigh these measurements basically in such a way that we get a measure of the power that we receive so this is an energy per time per surface area so wherever this uh, distribution peaks this is where the most of the uh, luminosity is coming from and so this this diagram shows 
the high energy part which is measured uh, with a train of telescopes. In this case this is the Hess array and on that side you've got the Fermilab points. I don't show you the picture here from Fermilab but Fermilab also can detect the supernova remnants. It's quite faint for Fermilab. You see also the error bars for the Fermilab points are quite big. The error bars at the uh, trink of telescope range are much much smaller because the larger collection area allows to collect uh, a lot of uh, photons or events. Now um, the energy spectrum extends so we were looking at this at 250 GeV, that would be around about here, so that's 250 GeV. But you see it goes up to TeV energy and then it goes to 10 TeV and even close to 100 TeV. So the most energetic flux or the most energy uh, bin, highest energy bin here is at the level of about 50 TeV. So 50 TeV means that the proton energy has to be at least 500 TeV. So that's already pretty close to this sort of 10 to the 15 which we are expecting to be. Now I also mentioned to you that the spectrum that we measure in gamma rays follows essentially the spectrum of the protons uh, of the source. However, if you now look at this uh, spectral slope that you see here, so remind you, so this is E squared times dn over dE, so if this one drops with increasing energy, it means that the uh, differential spectrum goes with e to the minus 2 and softer. Softer means the index is even steeper, so it's falling quicker. So uh, what you get here is something which is, you know, you see roughly one order of magnitude and it drops by about a um, factor of 2. So that means it's, it's of the order of 2.3, 2.4. So um, the proton energy spectrum goes with probably e to the minus 2.3, 2.4 around about. So it means it is softer than, than uh, what we naively expect, but not by much. I mean, you can see there's some uncertainties there. So roughly speaking, the spectral index is fine. Um, the maximum energy is a little bit low. Uh, you also see that the spectrum actually becomes steeper here. So a pure power law would basically continue like this. And you see that the data points over here are below that extrapolation. So that means that the spectrum is actually turning over probably exponentially at an energy of the order of 20 or so TeV. Uh, but simply speaking, this looks quite okay. And then one can also do a next step, basically record, re, when we record the flux and we know the distance to the source, we can also just say, what is the actual luminosity of this source? And remember, the luminosity is very closely connected to the total cosmic ray energy content. And um, if we assume that this is like a standard blast wave type scenario supernova, which is very likely the case, then we know that also the uh, uh, kinetic energy in the blast wave is again 10 to the 51 erg. And so we would expect that eta with 0.1, that is the efficiency of acceleration, would give us something like 10 to the 50. However, it turns out, that the uh, cosmic ray uh, energy that we get here is of the order of 5 times 10 to the 49 ergs. So that translates into an eta which is only 0 0.05. So this falls maybe a little bit short in terms of the uh, efficiency that is required. It could also be that we are maybe underestimating a little bit the gas content, but it is it tends to be on the smaller side and it's something which is a little bit worrisome, but on the other hand, um, there's not so many objects that we basically observe in this great detail, so maybe this is the one particular case. Even though, I have to say, the other cases that we do observe tend to have a similar feature. Now, um, there's however also another uh, scenario in which the gamma rays are not produced by protons. And uh, this is actually given some strength by the, uh, by the interesting feature of this uh, source that if you compare the gamma ray image with the X-ray image, then you, you really quickly realize that they are very, very similar. And the similarity is not necessarily expected because the X-rays are produced in uh, synchrotron emission processes uh, related to energetic electrons. If we are observing protons, there's really no reason why they should be the same because protons would be brighter in the regions where you have a higher density. They could, of course, also have the higher B field. But uh, it is not completely straightforward why it's supposed to be like this. So you can also do a nice uh, model where you would basically get away with having uh, electrons doing the emission both in the X-rays as well as in the uh, gamma rays. Uh, in the gamma rays, the proce procedure would be then that you have uh, inverse Compton um, uh, emission taking place. And so this would be a leptonic scenario. We call it leptonic because uh, you only need electrons 
and then the uh, cosmic rays that is mainly an electron energy is only uh, at the level of 10 to the 47 ergs and that has to do with the fact that electrons radiate much more efficiently than protons. So this basically means that it seems also plausible that what we're looking at are electrons and then basically um, the fact that all the emission could come from electrons means that we can only put an upper limit on the content in cosmic ray protons that has to be then substantially lower than 10 to the 49 so that would push this if the effective fee efficiency value of eta even below the five percent value and finally to conclude on this part um, let's have a look at what we can basically say about uh, the um, neutrino sky because in principle these kind of sources if they are protons um, that is if the gamma ray emission that we see comes from protons then we expect a similar um, flux level in terms of neutrinos because you have a, about the same numbers involved here the, the uh, branching ratio is about is actually larger um, you do have a mixture of muon electron neutrinos because the muons decay and so on so a little bit more complicated but roughly speaking you expect sort of the same fluxes and neutrinos also we're talking about similar energy ranges so uh, do we have a detection from neutrinos unfortunately i have to say that's not the case so let me just show you here a figure of uh, the neutrinos all sky as it's been observed with ice cube and so this is equatorial coordinates basically um, that means that uh, ice cube observes the um, large part of the northern sky because uh, ice cube is sensitive to muons which come uh, through the earth and so so the, the horizon is basically this this line here so everything above this line can be observed with ice cube and then uh, you see here now the um, um, let's say um, energetic muon events that is events which can be reconstructed fairly well in terms of their direction and you also see here the the value of energy plotted in uh, units of PEV and so uh, the galactic plane I believe is the solid line and there's really not much to say about that there's maybe an excess coming from the galactic plane even it seems like the the neutrinos are more or less uh, spread out um, isotropically um, in the visible part of the sky and there's um, there's not really much that you can learn from this in terms of source populations or even individual sources you can pick out keep in mind that um, the, the, uh, the the neutrinos which would come actually from the north pole so in this case from up here they are suppressed because neutrinos then start to interact inside the Earth at higher energy. So that means that you're basically sensitive to the region which basically show now the neutrinos. So the bottom line of this is neutrino observations are not sensitive enough to detect clearly any sources in the sky at this point. Before we go on with the ultra energy cosmic rays, I just wanted to add one more item uh, which we have done or which we have been able to do in terms of gamma ray emission from the galaxy. So until now we've been talking mainly about located gamma ray sources that is the accelerators in the sky should shine as gamma rays as gamma ray sources and however the cosmic rays as such as a, a relativistic gas fill a large volume in the galaxy and um, similar to spallation the protons or the nuclei of the cosmic rays they will interact with the background gas inelastically and they will produce then gamma rays and this could, would give rise to a diffuse gamma ray emission and uh, I'd like to talk about that for just a, a short bit here so um, the idea here is that um, you can expect diffuse gamma ray emission in the galaxy simply because protons will interact and there will be an emissivity which uh, depends upon the total uh, gas amount so uh, the, the uh, gas em the emissivity of the uh, interstellar medium so the ISM emissivity, um, we call that usually Q, let's say above 100 MeV energy, that's the family that energy range, is of the order of 2.3 times 10 to the minus 25 photons emitted per second and per hydrogen atom. Of the interstellar medium so that means that if you assume one uh, hydrogen atom per cubic centimeter then each cubic centimeter of 
Well, that should be per cubic centimeter. Sorry, there should be no per hydrogen atom. Uh, if you have one atom per cubic centimeter, then each cubic centimeter emits 10 to the minus 25 photons per second. And so if you basically assume that cosmic ray energy density is the same or the number of cosmic ray uh, particles is the same, then this basically scales with the energy density of cosmic rays, which has one electron volt per cubic centimeter. That's the typical value. So the emissivity will change depending upon how much cosmic rays you've got. And so basically um, the, the flux that you would get would be then simply um, taking uh, this emissivity and then you integrate along a line of sight um, the uh, density of the interstellar medium. And so um, you would also have here to have here the U cosmic ray that is the energy density in that particular medium. So with, with, um, the, with this kind of uh, situation, you can basically expect that the galaxy will be glowing in gamma rays. And we can confirm this. I'll just show you here the figure. This is the Fermi LAT data above an energy of about 100 MeV for several years. And this is now in galactic coordinates. That is, this is the galactic equator that you see, which runs here through the center of this picture. And then the full sphere is just projected down, similar like a, like a map. And so the galactic north pole would be up here, the galactic south pole would be here, and the galactic center would be then the direction in the center of this picture. And you see that there's essentially a very bright uh, diffuse band, which has some, some features which extend beyond this uh, narrow band around the equator. Um, and of course, you also see various individual isolated and uh, for located sources. These are all cosmic ray accelerators, very likely. And you also see a large number of sources which are at higher galactic latitude, both in the north and the southern hemisphere. These are most of them are actually really extragalactic sources, and we do not want to cover them in this course. But they are also cosmic ray accelerators, even though they very likely do not contribute to our cosmic ray um, pool in the galaxy. Um, you also see some, some features here, for example, which are sticking out. And this, as it turns out, is where also the gas density or the line of sight basically goes along the galaxy's gas density. This would be like a spiral arm that we're looking at. You see similar features over here. And to confirm also that this correlates very well with the uh, integrated gas density, I have here another figure, which I just want to uh, show first, maybe. So this is just the uh, galactic disk. And what is shown now here in color scale is the actual gas density integrated along that particular line of sight. And so you see that there's a very narrow, very bright part in the center of the galaxy. That's essentially molecular and atomic gas. This line emission is picked up in, in a band where we are sensitive to a particular transition of carbon monoxide in the galaxy. And I can just demonstrate to you now that this correlates very well uh, with the um, observed gamma ray emission. I just grab this one here and I just bring it down. And then you see that I can I don't know, just by eye sort of align it uh, with, the, uh, with, with the gamma ray emission. And you can clearly see that uh, lots of the features uh, that show up, for example, this feature up here, where you see some molecular gas, um, the spiral arm features, which I pointed out over here, they show up. Also, some of the features which you see down here, they show, they, they line up. It's not perfect, uh, that's also obvious. But it has generally the same kind of shape. You also see that there's a lot of emission on the northern hemisphere as well. And um, overall, uh, this can be used to determine a model where basically uh, we can calculate um, the, uh, the um, cosmic ray energy density and throughout the entire disk. Because we know that I mean, this measurement, which I show here, is just the integrated line luminosity. But since the line is observed at a frequency fixed relative to the uh, relative motion of the uh, emitter to the observer. So the gas which will move towards us will apparently be then blue shifted. That is, the line will move to higher frequencies, whereas the stuff which moves away from us due to galactic rotation will be red shifted. And this kind of um, a shift of, of the velocity or the relative velocity of the emission, emission region can be used to spatially resolve under the assumption of some rotation curve. Uh, the actual distribution of the gas in, in, the, in the disk. And then basically taking that into account, we can determine what is the cosmic ray energy distribution throughout the disk. And it turns out that it is really smooth. 
so there's no spiral arms or anything present. There's just a gradient from the central part to the outer part, which basically means that the energy density in cosmic rays in the central, let's say a few kiloparsecs, is maybe a factor of two to three larger than it is uh, locally, and then it drops even further if you go further out uh, towards the galactic anti-center, for example. So that's, that's basically the main conclusions here. Um, we, can, we can say that um, cosmic ray uh, produced gamma ray em emission, which traces the, the gas density. And furthermore, the um, actual uh, energy density of cosmic rays in the galaxy is fairly homogeneous. within a factor of one to three roundabout in, in the galactic disk. And uh, we can also have a look then at, um, you know, this is something where the modeling is actively ongoing, um, where you basically now assume that the accelerators of cosmic rays are distributed within the disk according to some scheme which follows, for example, the distribution of supernova remnants or pulsars. And then you realize that actually um, the distribution of cosmic rays that we measure radially, for example, um, traces out this kind of source distribution. And it seems to be quite consistent with the population where most of the cosmic rays are produced by supernova remnants, shell type supernova remnants, but there may be also an additional contribution coming from neutron stars, which may be needed to explain this very shallow gradient. 